Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahano Punaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejas Rinavati Tamas Duma Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 May Brahman protect us, may he guide us and give us strength and right understanding. May love and harmony be with us all. Om peace, peace, peace. And good evening. We're going to continue with the readings from the complete works of Swami Ramakrishnananda, one of Sri Ramakrishna's direct disciples, who founded the centers in the south part of India. And uh, we're reading his uh, lecture on Sri Ramakrishna and his mission. And then the last 15 minutes, we'll see the fourth movement of the Ramayana Symphony. And uh, you can see how many uh, various bhajan tunes you can recognize in the symphony. And there'll be a, a wide selection of pictures drawn from every possible genre, as well as archaeological photographs uh, depicting the various scenes from the uh, last portion of the Ramayana story, from the exile on to the triumphant return to Ayodhya and the subsequent um, disappearance of Sita back into the earth. But before we do that, we're going to read from uh, Swami Ramakrishnananda. It's interesting to get a slightly different uh, picture of Sri Ramakrishna's life here in capsule form from uh, one of the direct disciples. And last time we had just read the section where he had gotten his sacred thread and he had to pick who he would first beg his food from and he chose Dhani, which uh, was controversial because she was not of the uh, proper caste. And so we saw that even at an early age, he was uh, breaking the, the various social customs down uh, that needed to be uh, broken down. And so now uh, this section is going to talk about what happens at uh, various funeral ceremonies. And it says that it is a custom in Bengal to invite together the learned men of the surrounding places in a meeting hall to hold discussions on religious subjects during funeral ceremonies. Once when such a meeting was held in the mansions of the Laha family, uh, Sri Gadadhar, that's the young Ramakrishna, like the young Jesus, discussed with the wise men in such a way that they all admired and blessed him, <clears throat> saying, this extraordinary child will turn out to be an extraordinary, extraordinary man hereafter. So he was looked upon as a precocious and promising young boy by almost all the people of the village, some of whom used to regard him as more than human. One illiterate shell cutter by the name of Gina, his name was Srinivasa, sometimes used to take him to a solitary place to worship him with flowers and other offerings, such as sweetmeats, etc. And the simple man actually used to weep before him in true devotion, finding in him, as it were, his ideal God. By this, we can understand the influence which he unconsciously used to exercise around him, even in his boyhood. So it's really very interesting, isn't it, to see how uh, many of the people in the village during this early period had these very high regard for Sri Ramakrishna, and yet in uh, later years, uh, there were also people that thought he was uh, completely mad and uh, did inappropriate things at the, when he was the priest at the Dakshineshwar temple and so forth. And so uh, it's interesting that some people have the eye of wisdom to recognize divinity when they see it, and others do not. Others uh, misread all of those things as uh, being signs of uh, craziness. 
<clears throat> basically it's because <laughs> it's because people uh, worldly people think it's crazy not to enjoy the normal things that they're enjoying in the world and as they find somebody that's not interested in those things they they think he's crazy but it's interesting at this time people were uh, quite enamored with him and recognized that he was uh, a remarkable person and perhaps even divine. After s his several boyish pastimes, I will mention here two more, or among, excuse me, among his several boyish pastimes, I will mention here two more. He was a very good artist and could form such nice images out of clay that they actually fetched him money when exhibited in the market. He used to spend that money in entertaining his poor playmates. That his natural gift in this direction was not of a common kind may be easily understood by the fact that even the veteran painters, clay molders, and other artists used to take his opinion about the correctness of their paintings and images. So again, we find an extraordinary talent. And of course, most of these images are going to be of deities. And someone like Sri Ramakrishna uh, had probably inborn knowledge of these things that he probably wasn't even consciously aware of. And, and yet they were manifesting in these uh, simple ways where he could uh, make images out of clay, which of course, uh, in the villages of India would have been a very common thing for uh, young kids to do, but most of them probably were rather crude, but his seemed to have an expertise about them. He had great imitative power and could copy every movement of any man or woman. When he used to attire himself in female dress, none could detect him. Even his own girl playmates could not recognize him when disguised as one of them. He would come to talk with them. How wonderingly they would look at him when he would reveal his true self to them. He used to enjoy the fun very much. In this way, he endeared himself to all men and women. Uh, and I think this is a, another indication that uh, these great souls transcend gender. There's, there's, you know, God is genderless. Brahman is genderless. Uh, and even though we tend to divvy things up into various gender roles, uh, this is not really uh, the way things are in reality. And so we have this uh, tendency in Sri Ramakrishna to be able to take on any role that he choose, chose to take on. Uh, we have already said that his literary attainments were of a very rudimentary character. When he was 17 years old of age, that would be in 1853, he had copied a portion of the Yadakanda of the Bengali Ramayana written by Kritibhasa, wherein the date of its completion has been mentioned which is the 19th of Ashada of the Sana, 1256 Bengali year. The copy is being carefully preserved in the Belar Mat, which is now under the presidency of Swami Brahmanandaji. So this tells you when this was written. Obviously, Swami Ramakrishnananda predeceased Swami Brahmananda, so it would have had to have been written while Swami Brahmananda was the president. It is written neatly in the round hand of a boy without much care being paid to the correctness of the orthography. By this, even a superficial observer can judge of his literary merits. During this period of his life, he used to learn wrestling and with his supple limbs, he could assume any posture he liked to the astonishment of the bystanders. He could easily take most of the 80 kinds of postures which the Hatha yogis struggle and practice so much to assume. So again, these natural tendencies of, of these spiritual practices that uh, were exhibited by this very young Kadhadar uh, uh, before he was known as Sri Ramakrishna. 
And again, this just indicates that these samskaras uh, came in with him as, as an avatar. He would have come in with all of these samskaras of being adept at spiritual practices. And so even the various practices of the Hatha yogis came natural to him. And uh, wrestling apparently was a very common pastime among the boys of Bengal. We also uh, remember stories of the young Rakhal who would become Swami Brahmananda and the young Naran who would become Vivekananda. Uh, they would wrestle and there are stories of Sri Ramakrishna wrestling with the, uh, the future Vigyanananda. And so uh, there are several stories involving wrestling. So apparently it was a fairly common pastime for uh, young Bengal men in those days. He was 19 years of age when his brother Ram Kumar, who had a profound, uh, who was a profound Sanskrit scholar and who had a toll or free school in ja uh, Jamapukur in Calcutta, wrote a letter to him from the metropolis asking him to come over there. Although Ram Kumar was poor, he did not take any fee from his students as it was regarded by all the orthodox scholars of the old school as a sin to sell knowledge. From what has been already said, it is clear that Sri Ramakrishna was a little indebted, if at all, to any was little indebted, if at all, to any human being for his education. His mental development came naturally, and if anyone could claim to have been his teacher, it was capital nature herself. He was a minute observer of human nature, mixing with all classes of people. He knew the characteristics of all, keeping his own individuality intact. This wide experience was useful to him in his later days by supplying him with ample materials for his ever appealing, impressive, and beautiful parables, illustrations, and sayings. The world in which he lived was always beautiful like Sri Vrindavan, for it reflected his own pure heart, wherein the divine shepherd made his permanent residence. So his coming away from Kumar Prakur to Calcutta may be compared to Sri Krishna's departure from Gokula to Mathura. When his brother wrote to him to come to Calcutta, he had a twofold motive, one to give him some Sanskrit education, which he had been altogether neglecting, and the other to make him a useful member of the family by finding an appointment for him. Sri Ramakrishna always respected his eldest brother, and so on the receipt of the letter, he started for Calcutta, where although a new scene and a new field of action opened to him, he came out of the lap of nature to see the false imitation of art. But <clears throat> as he had too much of the former in him, the latter could not deceive him by her false glamour and his <clears throat> optimistic nature gave little way as he could not be pleased with seeming beauty and bliss, although he was not in the habit of confining himself to books in obedience to his brother's desire, he began to read the first Sanskrit grammar with him. This he continued for a few days. Once, when he was sitting alone in the veranda of his room, he saw a man well-versed in Nyaya, in Mimamsa, those are two of the other six systems of philosophy, whom he had known before carrying something, uh, whom he'd known before, and this person was carrying something in a napkin. And through familiarity, he asked the pundit what he was carrying in his cloth. Being answered that it was a little rice and green banana, which he had earned from the neighboring mansions by performing the priest's function there, Sri Ramakrishna at once began to reflect that if so much learning could bring nothing better than such a trifle, what was the necessity of taking so much trouble and getting by heart all the diff difficult aphorisms of grammar, logic, etc., till a man becomes old? 
Did not the common porter of the street earn his daily bread, although he might not know to read a single letter? He would not have such knowledge. It was not worth a pie, and from that moment he gave up all idea of pursuing his studies, studying the grammar as usual, and when he explained, Ram Kumar laughed at him, thinking him a foolish young lad. For it was, and still is, a notion among, amongst all learned scholars that knowledge is merely an intellectual pastime, that it is not necessary that everyone should follow the teachings of the sages who want us to regard the world as false and Brahman alone as real. So it was natural for Ram Kumar to take him to be an inexperienced boy who knew little about the world, but who would only learn from further experience. He asked him to give up all his wild views and continue his studies. But Sri Ramakrishna told him decidedly that he was not going to learn what could never take him beyond all wants and, <clears throat> and that he would try to get such knowledge knowing which all his physical, mental, and spiritual wants would leave him for all. Ram Kumaro laughed still more, but as he was a loving and very good brother, he did not press his request very much and allowed him to have his will for some time, believing that time itself would teach him a better lesson. But of course, uh, we know that Sri Ramakrishna's uh, innate uh, intelligence and ability to extract information from, as it said, from nature and from his surroundings uh, would be his primary way of learning, in addition to, of course, pursuing the, as he puts it here, this, the ultimate source of knowledge, knowing his true identity with the divine, knowing, being able to communicate with the divine mother directly. Uh, what what other kind of learning do you need when you've you've got that? Uh, you can always depend on the Divine Mother to guide you in every step. You hardly need to know much else. You don't need to know anything else. It's interesting that uh, Swami Vivekananda also seemed to have this keen observation of people and nature and as he traveled through the various countries around the world, he always seemed to be able to grasp the character of a country and its people and so forth and summarize it in uh, insightful ways. So this seemed to come with the, the territory with these great spiritual souls. Sri Ramakrishna was now left free he used to go occasionally to Mr. Digambar Mitra's big mansion in the neighborhood with his brother, who was honored and patronized by Mr. Mitra and many other wealthy people of the place on account of his excellent character and profound scholarship. The sweet voice and amiable character of Sri Ramakrishna at once made him a favorite of all the members of the Mitra's family, and especially of the ladies who loved to hear him sing his devotional songs, often and often. The spirit of Kamar Pakur began to revive a little. Yeah, we had read earlier that he was very, the women were very fond of the, the very young boy. He enchanted the, the women of his village. And so now we're finding the similar things here. He's enchanting uh, all the ladies of the Mitra uh, household, especially with his uh, beautiful voice uh, singing devotional songs. And of course, when he would sing a devotional song, it was coming from a very deep place. It wasn't just like somebody singing it as some expert singer uh, would sing it as an accomplished artist but he was doing it as someone who had a, a profound connection with the divine, and that comes forth. That comes forth and when he's singing. People intuitively picked up that there was something special about his singing uh, when he was singing devotional songs. Even if they couldn't put their finger on it, it was because he was connected to the highest spiritual levels in a very deep sense. 
even when he wasn't totally aware of it himself. But uh, his samskaras were there, and so that uh, the devotional songs came out with a power that would not have been expressed by just a good singer. There was a very wealthy later named Rani Rashmani at Jean Bazar, Calcutta, who was famous for her keen intellect, sagacity, and piety. She wanted to dedicate a temple to the goddess Kali, so she purchased a big plot of land on the Ganga at Dakshineshwar, a village about four miles north of Calcutta. <laughs> it's like L.A. now. You can't tell where one thing ends and another begins. Calcutta is just one enormous sprawl. Uh, it's, so it's difficult to imagine that uh, Dakshineshwar was a, a little village separated from Calcutta. Uh, just as now it's difficult to imagine that uh, South Pasadena and Pasadena were a trip <laughs> to be taken from Los Angeles. When Vivekananda gave lectures in Los Angeles, they had to make the trip down to Los Angeles from South Pasadena. Um, <clears throat> all right, so uh, although she was born of a low caste, she desired that a good Brahm Brahmana uh, should help her in this noble undertaking by accepting her gifts and becoming priests to the goddess. With this intention, she sent men to different centers of learning in and outside the metropolis to ask the opinions of the learned pundits about her project. And she was puzzled to find that each and every one of them told her that as she was a Sudra lady, she could not expect good Brahmanas to partake in the intended ceremony and festival. So again, we see the caste prejudice looming here in the ancient Indian style. She was really disgusted and did not know what to do. At last she came across Ram Kumar and asked his opinion about it, and he, after deep deliberation, asked her to write down the property in the name of her guru, who was a Brahmana, and all the difficulties would thus be removed. For, in that case, the property coming to belong to a twice-born no good Brahmana should have any objection to partake in the festival. This pleased the Rani exceedingly, and she immediately did as she was advised. The property was co uh, which cost her more than 12 lakhs of rupees was written in her guru's name. It was on the day of the bathing festival of Sri Jagannath in the year 1855 that that inaugural ceremony began, and one of the biggest temples which had been built on the spacious land was formally dedicated to the mother of the universe, the goddess Kali. Innumerable men and women flocked from all directions and were sumptuously entertained. But the orthodox Brahmins refrained from coming there, although there was no good reason for their behaving so except the social custom. As no other Brahmin sympathized with her, Ram, uh, Ram Kumar was requested to be the high priest to the goddess, and he readily agreed. His brother followed him, that would be Sri Ramakrishna, on the inauguration day, and amongst all the feastings, he alone remained fasting, not liking to partake of a sudra's food, and he appeased his hunger by taking a quarter anna worth of popped rice in the evening. It was as if the hereditary orthodoxy made its appearance for the first time, although only to die after a while. When the ceremony was over, he expressed his sorrow at his brother's acceptance as accepting the service of a sudra. But when Ram Kumar quoted several passages from the scriptures to show that he was all right, Sri Ramakrishna was perfectly satisfied and began to take his meals there along with him. So that's interesting that the brother was actually then also influential in breaking down these caste distinctions, which Sri Ramakrishna had already broken down, and yet somehow um, old habits crept in, and then the brother had to come in to uh, break them. So uh, interesting how the drama of uh, the Divine Mother plays out here. 
Many Brahmins at home criticized Ram Kumar of accepting the service of Ashuda, and when Ramakrishna returned home after a few days, they began to shower their invectives against the indiscreet and improper action of his brother. He learned all this, but kept silent, perfectly at peace within himself as to his brother's unimpeachable conduct. After staying for a few days at home, during which he paid a visit to his nephew, Hridoy, who would, of course, later play quite a significant role there <coughs> at uh, Sihar, a village five miles from his town, he returned to Dakshineshwar and stayed with Ram Kumar. One day, he took a little clay from the bank of the Holy Ganga and fashioned out of it such a beautiful image of Shiva riding on a bull that it attracted the admiration of all the people who saw it. Uh, Mataranat Bishwas, the son-in-law of Rani Rashmani and the manager of her estate, was walking up and down the garden at the time. He also saw the beautiful image and was so much charmed by it that he at once wanted to know who the artist was. On being told that the younger brother of his high priest had done this, he, was, he at once wanted to see him and accepted Ram Kumar, requested Ram Kumar to bring, him, uh, bring his artist brother to him. As soon as Mataranat, uh, later known as uh, Matar Babu, who was again was the manager of the temple property during Sri Ramakrishna's stay there as well. As soon as he saw Sri Ramakrishna, he was so charmed with his sweet personality that he desired to employ him as a priest along with his brother, and an opportunity soon presented itself. By the side of Kali's temple, there was a Vishnu Mandira in the same compound, and a Brahmana who em was employed at the worship of the god. Through his carelessness, he one day broke the leg of the image, and a great commotion took place throughout the temple precincts. The news also reached the Rani at Jean Bazar. She was sorely displeased with the carelessness of her priest and did not know what to do with the broken image. She asked the advice of many pundits who unanimously told her to throw it away and replace it by a new one. Sri Ramakrishna's opinion was also sought, and he simply asked the Rani to inquire of the pundits how they would advise a lady if her husband's leg got broken or fractured. Would they advise her to throw him away or keep him under the treatment of a good doctor until he got completely cured? Of course, the wise men had to give the preference to the latter procedure, at which Sri Ramakrishna asked the Rani if, in worshipping the holy image, she had been worshipping her real husband or merely an idol. The sagacious Rani at once understood the force of his argument and asked him to, under, uh, to cure the broken limb, having heard of him previously as a skillful natural artist. He mended the broken limb in such a skillful, uh, such a natural way that none could detect that it had been broken at all. The Rani was very much pleased at all of this, and she requested him to be employed as a permanent worshiper of the god, to which he said he would consent, provided his nephew Fridoi would be allowed to live with him in the temple. The Rani at once complied, and Sri Ramakrishna was employed as a priest of the Vishnu temple, while Fridai became an adorner of Kali's holy person. Within six months, however, the former was transferred to Kali's temple, and Ran Kumar had to take charge of the uh, Vishnu Mandiram. When Mother Kali was put under Sri Ramakrishna's care, a great spiritual storm was gradually beginning to gather strength within him. He was naturally fond of his mother goddess, and when, Kumar, uh, when at Kamar Kapoor, he had been in the habit of worshipping her with his playfellows. That had been one of his several favorite plays of his boyhood. Now he had her actual before him as his own beloved eternal mother. It was no longer a play, but a serious affair to him. His joy knew, knew no bounds at first. 
Early in the morning, he used to rise from his bed, take a flower basket in his hand, gather the choicest flowers from the spacious garden surrounding the big temple, and he would take the most beautiful garlands out of them and adorn his beloved mother with it. When he sat down to worship, he knew uh, not when to stop. Such was also the case when he waved the holy light before the goddess. To him, she was not a stone image, but a living mother. And could a loving and dutiful child like him feel anything but intense bliss in her sweet company? He used to sing songs to her, songs that had flowed out of his pure heart of a f former saintly and beloved child of hers, Ram Prasad, so that she might be pleased. Every moment of his life passed in the thought of how to please her. Sleep forsook him in the night when his mind tried to devise the best way of worshiping his beloved one. If the day were a little hot, he would stand by her side fanning for hours together. He used to prepare beetle leaves with finely cut nuts in the most exquisite manner so that his mother might be perfectly pleased in chewing them. For the first few months, he forgot all about himself and was filled with his divine mother. When he sat down to meditate upon her, space and time were completely overlooked, and he used to lose himself in her. And that is, yeah, so we will discontinue the reading there, pick it up next time. And so we'll start the, the Ramayana Symphony uh, Movement 4. And as I said, it starts with the exile of uh, Rama, Sita, and Lakshman into the forest. And uh, you'll see the various episodes. If you're familiar with the story, you'll see how he has to defeat a demon and how uh, the sister of Ravana comes and tries to seduce uh, Rama and then uh, Lakshmana finds her doing mis uh, mistreating Sita and cuts off her nose, and she goes back and complains to her brother, and uh, the drama ensues. You'll see Jatayu, uh, the bird that uh, tries to warn um, Rama of what's going to be happening. Uh, you'll see Hanuman. Uh, you'll see the, all the little animals forming the bridge over to Sri Lanka. You'll see Hanuman setting fire to Lanka. So all of these familiar stories. Then you'll, <clears throat> when Ravana is finally uh, slain, they will return to uh, Ayodhya and you'll see the typical Diwali lights and the reception and the fireworks. But then of course the citizens of Ayodhya uh, question Sita's purity and sh she goes through various tests of fire that still doesn't satisfy them so she decides to take uh, refuge back into Mother Earth who is what her true nature is so we shall now start the video so we can turn the various lights off <clears throat>
Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purname Vavashishate Om Shanti 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 Filled with Brahman are the things we see, filled with Brahman are the things we see not. From out of Brahman floweth all that is, from Brahman all, yet is it still the same. Om peace, peace, peace.